Um, Beth joined my lab in 2007. She came from University of Puget Sound where she did an undergrad degree in biology and political economy. So uh, two quite diverse topics. And um, I'm very happy that Beth is nearly finishing before she hits that dreaded eighth year. She's, she's, she's getting there. And um, Beth has uh, perhaps had, of all the students I've had, she's had the most sort of trials and tribulations in completing her PhD through, through no fault of her own. She's had excessive predation of some of her Kestrel nest boxes. Um, the weather has had a terrible effect for some of her seasons. But saying that, she's probably one of the most resourceful students I've ever had in that she's persisted with some of her nest box work, but really found very innovative ways to get other kinds of data by traveling to other places in the US to be able to answer the questions she was interested in her dissertation. So her thesis is really um, pretty unique in many respects in that it combines sort of a classical behavioral approach using um, several different field sites with really re very much integrated museum science. So she did a lot of visiting of museum collections, collecting data, made use of some captive colony work to look at hereditary of traits, and it's all sort of come together around these central questions that she's going to tell us about today. I just want to say one other thing for about Beth, and that is to really thank her because of all the students um, that we've had in the museum, she's probably made one of the greatest contributions to the museum collections as a whole. She's really been an outstanding curatorial assistant and has trained many of you in preparing specimens and curatorial work, so we remain very grateful for that. And then the exciting news, most of you know, but Beth has already got a position, so in the fall she'll be starting as the curator of vertebrates at the University of Wyoming. So there's nothing like a job to light the fire under you. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you, Beth. Thank you, Rory. Thank you guys for coming. Um, I'm going to try to keep this I know so many of you guys have exams, so many of you have come from far away. Uh, thanks for coming to, to hear. I'm going to talk about uh, just a portion of my dissertation, so I'm going to try and keep this short. Um, and of course, uh, questions afterwards. I know some of you have prepared questions. <laughs> um, all right, so my dissertation is really looking at the range and use of plumage variation in the American kestrel. And one of the things I've really become fascinated with with my time here at Berkeley is just how much plumage variation there is and how the variation uh, can be controlled and what maintains variation. And variation within birds can occur in, in many different settings. Sometimes you can have just plain mutations where you have this adult red tail here that's uh, a leucistic and so he has a mutation going on individually just for him. We don't really see that morph that many times uh, in the population. You can see plumage variation that's controlled by uh, behavior, like with the individual recognition and sexual behavior you see with these ruffs, uh, social dominance behavior with the um, house sparrows. You can see uh, plumage variation controlled just by genetic variation with the MC1R with banana quits. And then you can also have plumage variation that even occurs so within species, within populations, even within nests. So like here with the eastern screech owls where you could have within the same nest uh, red morphs and gray morphs. So there's a lot of different variation. And one of the things I really became fascinated with is, is how it's maintained in a population and, and what it could be used for. So if we look at the drivers of variation in birds, there's sort of three basic areas that you can look for. You can look at behavioral selection, ecological selection, and, and genetics uh, correlation. And so some examples of this uh, with barn owls, where they have um, different morphs specifically along how much red color they have in their breast feathers, and then also how many spots and how large the spots are on each of these breast feathers. What we've seen is Roland has been studying this um, barn owls in Europe for uh, many decades, and what you're seeing, uh, he's been able to look at sexual selection with these, and it seems that males that have um, have uh, more white plumage are recruited into population faster. And then females that actually have uh, redder plumage seem to be recruited faster. Um, and also you see with the number of spots that uh, the mean diameter of the spots uh, correlates also with the age category for first breeding. So females that have larger spots, you're going to see them actually uh, breeding uh, faster in their first year than their cohorts that have smaller spots. So sexual selection seems to control sometimes or affect uh, the maintained mean of 
variation. You can see ecological selection, and this is some of the things that have been starting to work out now, also affected by climate change. Um, so these are um, tawny owls. Uh, and what uh, this was, Carol and all did a recent work, and what they looked at is actually the effect of snow depth and change in temperature, and how that's affected over time the ratio of red morphs to gray morphs. And it seems what happens with these owls is that the gray morphs do better when you have higher snow depth in the winter time, and so colder temperatures. And as snow depth has decreased over the years, you started to see an increase actually in the number of red morphs of this uh, species occurring uh, throughout their population. So ecological selection seems to be fluctuating and maintaining this variation. And then you can also have genetic correlation where we don't understand possibly yet if there is a behavioral aspect or an ecological aspect, but we understand somewhat of how the genetics are correlated behind the trait. And uh, one of my favorite examples recently is with jeer falcons where we actually looked at um, or Johnson looked at with the MC1R, and they were able to find an amino acid substitution within uh, the MC1R from uh, the isoleucine to the valine. And they tied uh, specifically <coughs> the amino acid substitution to white coloration. So, jeer falcons have three different to four different morphs, depending on who you talk to. They have white morphs <coughs> and gray or silver morphs. And if you're lucky, you get black morphs or very gray morphs. And so, across the population, you see um, the different uh, white morphs seem to have a specific amino acid substitution, and that seems to be conserved. There's a little bit of difference in uh, the gray morphs. Some of them in Greenland and Alaska, and possibly in Iceland, um, are heterozygous for their amino acid substitutions in MC1R. So that may also be controlled by ecological selection. There's not a lot of work on that yet, but we understand the genetic correlation behind it and how changes in your genome can create and affect the different um, plumage variations you see. And plumage variation itself is actually really high, and particularly in the birds of prey. So I gave you three different examples of birds <coughs> of prey. I'm trying to set up a theme here. It is one of my favorite groups to work in. Um, Ociparidiformes, Ociparididae has about 21% of the uh, species in that family have um, some kind of polymorphic plumage. In Strigiformes, you have 36%. In Falconiformes, you have 14%. And what Hugo and Stuart Fox looked at was actually, it seems that if you have higher rates of polymorphism in your plumage, in particular in these birds that, that are predatory bird groups that have high polymorphism, uh, species or numbers of uh, species are polymorphic, you also seem to have higher speciation rates. So it's not only something that can control within a population, but it seems to control the rate of speciation across the family, um, potentially. So a lot of broad pictures, a lot of broad questions you can look at. Um, I zoomed in particular to look at one <coughs> species, uh, which is the American kestrel. It's within Falconiformes and Falconididae, so a group that has a lot of polymorphism uh, in the family itself. The American kestrel has been commonly grouped in with the other kestrels. There are approximately about 14 different species across um, the world. There's only one, though, in the New World, and that's ours. And they're all being grouped sort of by behavior and by coloration. And so kestrels tend to hover hunt. Um, they tend to be sexually dichromatic, though some of them are less so than others. These guys are from uh, South Africa, greater kestrel. Um, but in general, they seem to have rufous on their back, longer tails, shorter toes, um, <coughs> and do hover hunting behavior. There hasn't been a lot of genetic work on it. This is a, a cytochrome B tree that Groombridge et al. came out in 2002, specifically looking at the um, evolution phylogeography of kestrels uh, throughout Africa, but they managed to pull uh, American kestrel in from gene bank, and so this is the best tree we have at the moment. You see the other kestrels across the world, the samples they did have, do form a monophyletic group. The American kestrel is outside of that group, and there's um, new information that will be coming out soon uh, that potentially hints at the fact that American kestrels are actually not even in the same group as the rest of the kestrels. So while they look very similar, they act very similar to the other kestrels, they've actually seemed to converge on this plumage. So if we zoom in even further, this is the species I work on, this is the American kestrel. It's the only kestrel found in the entire New World. It 
has a range that expands from the boreal forest uh, tree line up in Alaska and the Yukon Territory all the way down to the tip of South America. And one of the things I thought I'd do when I started my dissertation is there are 17 different subspecies, but they've never been tested. And I thought, I'll get samples from everyone. And then I thought about that a lot. And I was like, mm, let's save that for like a long-term plan, maybe. Um, but they're really interesting. There's 17 different subspecies. Specifically, I work on two. Uh, F.S. barbarius, which is the nominate subspecies. Its range goes from the tree line of Alaska down to the edge of Baja, California, and Mexico, and southeastern uh, United States. And I also work on F.S. polis, which is our southeastern American kestrel. That's found in Georgia and Florida. And then the rest of them are found pretty much south. And they all are really conserved in their plumage. Now, I, I want to clarify that. Because actually when they did the species description for this bird, and then when they did the species description for many of the subspecies, they actually said the plumage in this bird, there are so many traits that are so variable, they're undefinable. So within individuals, they seem to vary somewhat. We can't get a handle on, you know, why this variation or, or how we group them. Um, so a lot of the subspecies grouping is actually based upon size, very difference, uh, small differences in size. But there are four different subspecies that do have different uh, plumage characteristics. If you've used to looking at kestrels for years and years, they look different. Um, so I'm just going to introduce them. I don't do work on them, but I think they're pretty cool. Um, and potential future research work. Uh, Peninsulars is found in Baja, California. This is a very tiny little kestrel. American kestrels around here are about 100 grams. These guys are about half that size. They are um, also much lighter in coloration. And then we're going to look at um, the other four, three are different island subspecies. So Dominicensis is found in Puerto Rico. It's extremely light, um, almost white in the front. Caribbean is found in the Lesser Antilles, and this is a very interesting one because the males are actually going towards the female plumage. So the males are, are abandoning their sexual dichromatism. And then you see uh, the very last one, Spartaburioides, which is in Cuba and Jamaica. And this one actually has two different morphs, so a light morph and a dark morph, and they still maintain their sexual dichromatism. So there are male light morphs and female light morphs and male dark morphs and female dark morphs. Um, but I work on uh, a regular looking kestrel, you can call them regular. Uh, so some basic things to orient you for kestrels across the entire talk. They are sexually dichromatic. Females look different than males. They always look different. So even as soon as they get their first feathers, they don't go through uh, juvenile plumage that looks like, say, the female, which is what you see in all the other kestrels. Instead, what you have is female American kestrels will always have these red wings with barring on them. Males will have these beautiful blue-gray wings. And then females have um, this black and red uh, barring up throughout the tail. And males have mostly a clear orange tail with a big black subterminal band. And these characteristics are found in the hand. You can again see it actually as soon as the pin feathers start to develop on the birds. I can sex them without having to do genetics, which is really nice. And um, <coughs> You can see it also when they're hovering, uh, so when they're hunting, when they're defending a territory, when they're moving around. These characteristics are also very noticeable. There has been some work to try and define some of these highly variable <coughs> plumage uh, characteristics within the species. Um, some of them have looked at clinal variation. So Smollett et al. looked at juvenile birds, so birds in their first year, using uh, banding uh, nest box work across the United States. And what they found is in the rufous, the size of the rufous crown patch for the birds, you uh, have a smaller patch as you move across um, from north to south, across North America. And then also barring on the back for the males. So as you're up high, say in like British Columbia or Alaska, you'll have more barring than potentially you'll see on a juvenile first year male if you move south, say down to Texas. Um, and then there's been some work also looking at sexual selection for the species. Uh, so one of them has been looking at soft part coloration. This is sear coloration. The interesting thing about the sear is it seems that kestrels will shunt carotenoids into their sear. Carotenoids give you orange coloration. This is oftentimes what you see with house sparrows that produce that beautiful 
uh, red color in the males. Um, so we know that males actually shunt more coloration and their seers are brighter than females. Uh, they're also brighter than first years. Uh, we also know that they're brighter uh, even within males during the breeding season than they are outside of the breeding season. And Dawson and Bartolotti uh, tied this actually and looked at the pre-laying color score. Uh, so over here you have dull yellow males and over here would be bright orange males. And the probability of reducing the parasitism so blood parasites is what they were wondering. If you have a brightly colored male with a seer, could he be signaling something to the female about his health or his wellness because these guys are monogamous and the male actually spends quite a bit of time taking care of the nest. You want a healthy, fit male. So what they tested for is it seems there's no difference in actually the <coughs> load of parasites. But there was a difference in the decrease or the probability of reducing parasitism. So males that had brighter seer colors in the pre-laying uh, time would actually then reduce their parasitism uh, by a higher amount than males that had a lower uh, pre-laying uh, seer color. So some idea that this may be a signal for females that perhaps that brighter males are healthier. There's also been some work looking at the width of the subterminal black band and plumage score brightness uh, for male kestrels. And for this, uh, what Wine found was that if you had a narrower band, uh, subterminal band on your kestrels, they seemed to actually, uh, their females anyway, hunted less. Uh, so it seems that potentially they were doing better care at the nest and the females had to do less effort in the hunting. But that's been much of the work actually <coughs> done with the plumage is that. And it leaves out some really variable and interesting colors. Uh, and traits. And the one I was really interested in actually is this black and white coloration on the male's tails. And this is one of those traits that was defined as undefinable, which is an oxymoron. Um, and what you see is it is really variable. Here on the west coast we can get birds that have almost no black and white to ones that have all black and white on the outer tail feathers. But then you can also get some weird stuff coming in where the black and white seems to go all the way across almost the tail feathers. So obviously there's a lot of variability. It has a lot of difference in this tail coloration. So I was like, this will be an interesting thing to look at. Potentially, uh, now I look back at myself, uh, a very difficult thing to look at. But I figured I'd give it a try. Um, so there was four basic questions I wanted to ask for my dissertation. Is there repeatable and inheritable elements in the tail patterning of the American kestrels, the males? Is the tail pattern used for behavioral signaling? So if there is repeatable and inheritable elements, what maintains it? Is it behavior? Is there a genetic correlation? So potentially that there is some kind of genetic factor that's getting you larger coloration or less coloration. Or is there perhaps a correlation between ecosystem and habitat factors? Today I'm only going to talk about the first two with you guys. So first, let's go in and see if we can actually even find repeatable measures. So what I did for this is I started in the MVZ and then I tested uh, it at the Smithsonian. And I went through each collection and I put birds on a green screen background and then I wore blue colored gloves. And what this allowed me to do is take these pictures in RAW, put them into Photoshop, and then use Photoshop to actually select out the color I was interested in. And so what Photoshop could tell me, because I have a known measurement score here, is how much actually there is black and white on each of the tails. So not only is there a large number of, uh, I can get the actual area of black and white for the tails, but I can also then just look for basic binning patterns. Do I see any repeatability? Or is every single kestrel I see different? Uh, which is kind of what I thought it would be at the beginning. Um, <laughs> turns out it's not. Uh, turns out there are three <coughs> basic patterns for male American kestrels. And these are only dealing with the outer tail feather here. So there's pattern one, where you have one, two, three, four to five black bands. Pattern two, where you have one, two, and three black bands. And pattern three, where you only have one black band. And what I was able to do using the Photoshop data is look that there's actually significant difference in the amount of black and white in each of these different pattern bits. So it seems that I did was able to find repeatable measures for patterns on the outer tail feathers. 
But there was also another layer of variation that I ended up looking at. And this one is not as easy to bend discreetly. So what I ended up doing is four different levels of variation. And these go from having absolutely no variation, so where you just have black and white on the outer tail feather, which defines your pattern, to having very large variation, where you have your black and white outer tail feather, but then you have color that goes all the way in to the uh, inner tail feathers. And looking at these, so looking at the coloration across the entire tail, there is a significant difference in the amount of white on the large variation and then between the small and none categories, but there was no difference in the amount of black. And that could possibly be because we've got so much variation coming in here. There were uh, males that had odd blotches of black that showed up uh, randomly and stuff. So I consider then the patterns to be actual uh, discrete groups. The variation is sort of a uh, distribution across. So four different levels, three patterns, four different levels across the tail. All right, so I know it's repeatable. I know I can find it across the range. What does that tell me about then, is it used for behavior? If it's used for behavior, I want to understand, do males even repeat the same color? So when they molt, and is it inheritable? Is, is, do fathers and sons pass these traits on? So to do this, at first I thought I would do this at my nest box sites, and I, my, none of my kids that I banded ever came back. Uh, they went out to the ether and, and hopefully bred somewhere else. So what I did instead is the USGS Patuxent Wildlife Research Center. You may know them. These are the guys who have the captive uh, whooping cranes uh, facility. They have a captive population of American kestrels <coughs> in large fly cages. And they allowed me to go out there and look at their uh, fathers and sons uh, between years and then within year. They also have a captive colony of eastern screech owls, in case anyone's interested in looking with other morphs. <coughs> So first thing I would talk about is change between molt. And so what you have here with this data, I wanted to know if a male molts his feathers one year, if what you're actually seeing is then do they grow into the same pattern the next year. So what Patuxent did for me is during the 2011 season, they collected all the feathers they could find on the base of the cages. Uh, they couldn't find all the feathers, which is I think mice possibly were stealing them or, or earthworms or who knows? Um, but then, so they collected those in bags, I deed them to the bird for me, and then I came in 2012 after the birds had renewed and grown their next set of feathers and compared the difference uh, between them. And the way I looked at it, uh, here's in case anyone's interested uh, and you've forgotten the way the different patterns look, I'll always have sort of this little guide for you. So pattern one, again, remember, has the most black and white, pattern two has half, and pattern three has almost no black and white. Um, the way I looked at this actually to try and figure out change in pattern over the <coughs> molt. And so I took the pattern of the current year and minus it from the pattern of the previous year. And if you have a zero, you have no change. And then if you decrease your numbers, then you decrease in color. So say you go from pattern two to a pattern three. And if you increase, then you go say from a pattern three to a pattern one. So you increase the amount of color on your tail. So overall it looks now remember, this is a captive population in even conditions with all the food they could possibly want. But in those conditions, they seem to maintain their <coughs> molt and their, their pattern through molt. And then I looked at inheritance. And because I was looking at fathers and sons with this, I could actually look at both pattern and variation. Because the pattern's in discrete categories, I couldn't use uh, parent offspring regression like I could with variation. So instead, I went back to what I did with molt and look, tried to figure out, is there differences, is there a change in pattern from father to son? Using the same uh, system I used before with molt, tail of the father minus the tail of the son, zero is no change, <coughs> positive would be an increase. So what we see is, is in general, if you've, um, most of the sons actually have their father's patterns. So it seems to be the pattern is probably inheritable. And over here, what we're actually looking at is mid-sun tail variation. So mid-sun or mid-offspring is the average value for the entire nest. So say if you have two sons, I took the average variation score for those two sons. And then the father's tail variation. And I did parent offspring regression. And this one also seems to be extremely heritable. The uh, points here are larger for the number of individuals that are at that uh, area. And our heritability score was uh, 
0 0.85, 0 0.86, which means approximately about 86% of the variation is explained potentially by heritability for the trait. So it seems like not only does the pattern in ideal conditions maintain over molt, it seems to be inheritable, and variation seems to be inheritable. All right, so is it repeatable in the heritable elements? Yes. All right, let's take a look at some behavior. I, I, I. All right, so for behavior, uh, there are three basic hypotheses I wanted to look at. One of them I could look at in a greater degree than the others. Um, but I, I sort of theorized that there were three different things that could actually contribute or maintain plumage variation uh, if it's going with behavior. There could be mate choice. So the tail pattern is to potentially use this signal by females for sexual selection. It could be status signaling. Tail patterns are used as a signal status or dominance between individuals. Or individual recognition, where they actually use the tail pattern to recognize specific individuals. And I have different predictions that I tested for each one. Uh, we'll look at individual recognition first, and then we'll step through each of the other ones as well. Um, so individual recognition, the best way to test this is actually to do manipulation experiments. So potentially if you caught the individual, you changed their tail pattern, and, and then you let them go. I wasn't able to do that with my behavioral work. So instead, I just looked at the prediction of individual males in one area should have tail patterns that are unique from their neighbors. So within one breeding area, they should have lots of variation going on. So they can recognize their neighbor from their other neighbor. For status signaling, males with a certain tail pattern will be in better condition. So if you're displaying one tail pattern, you're telling your neighbor, I'm in good condition, don't fight me for my territory. Uh, this could also overlap a lot with mate choice, and dividing out those areas would be further work that I wasn't able to do. Um, but looking specifically at mate choice, there were some things I wanted to, or able to examine. I could examine proxies for female choice. So one of the proxies you could potentially, um, you can always use is females, uh, if they, think a male is more desirable, has better traits, you'll begin to nest with that male faster than other ones. So they're not as choosy. They think that's the best choice they can get. They'll choose that male. Females will invest more energy into a mating attempt. So say they'll actually lay a larger number of eggs in that mating attempt. If the male seems to be giving some signal about that they're a better male. Males with a certain tail pattern will have greater fitness success, potentially by the number of fledglings or fledglings that they actually produce. And then males with certain tail pattern will invest a greater amount to the caring of their offspring. So trying to get a direct uh, um, handle on if the tail pattern is different, do males actually do more at the nest? Um, so do they seem to uh, provide more to the female and to their nestlings? So I did all my behavioral selection uh, work here in Northern California. Uh, I work at four different sites. Two of them I set up myself at Hoplin, Blue Oak. Sonoma Mountain Ranch is in conjunction with uh, Jeff Wilcox. Flying M Ranch is in collaboration with Steve Simmons. Three of my sites, Hoplin, Sonoma, and Blue Oak, are in uh, oak woodlands interspersed with open grasslands. And Flying M Ranch is uh, in Merced County in the Central Valley, and it's flat open grasslands across the landscape. See for miles. Very different than the hills I worked in otherwise. So we set up nest boxes at each of the sites. The full study period covered four years, and I had approximately 278 boxes <coughs> across all the sites. Um, Hopland, I ran for four years, and I put up 53 nest boxes. Blue Oak Ranch, I ran for four years, put up 43. Sonoma Mountain Ranch, Jeff, uh, we just started in 2012, and we're uh, starting a long-term project there now. 2012, we started with 32 boxes. And the Flying M Ranch was a humongous effort uh, over a 10-year study period uh, run by Steve Simmons, a retired woodshop high school teacher uh, who became a wonderful field biologist. And he had over approximately 150 boxes in the Central Valley that he ran. So the data I actually collected at these uh, sites, uh, trying to look at timing, number of eggs, uh, we counted the number of eggs and when they first appeared. We caught parents when we could and identified the parents, looked at their condition, took morphological measurements and blood samples. We looked at the condition and parental effort actually <coughs> at the nest. So how many chicks? How long did we see this number of chicks? Did they seem in good health? Um, 
what prey delivery seemed to be going on. And then we also looked at the number of fledglings. And we also took morphological measurements of the fledglings. And both fledglings <coughs> and adults I banded to see if they would come back to the site. Fortunately, none of the fledglings ever came back. Some of the adults did. Um, so using this data, let's go through those three individual hypotheses I talked about for behavioral recognition. Again, here's your pattern guide, in case you're looking. So remember, individual recognition, my prediction is that if you nest within one site close together, you should be highly variable from your neighbor. Because that way you can identify your neighbor is different from yourself. Um, so here are my nest box sites. Here, and this is, we're just looking at Hopland in 2012. And these are the males that I was able to get uh, good pictures to show you of their tail patterns. Each of these males corresponds to one of these nest box sites. Nest boxes are approximately 200 meters apart. Um, the closest ones, the farthest ones are about 500 or so meters. Um, there, there, there's not a lot of variation. It's, uh, I've tried to explain this slide very different ways to people. and. and um, I, th I think the best reaction I got was, uh, you have to wait, you have to stop. I can't find the differences. Mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately, that, that's the point, is the fact that um, there are some differences. And there are subtle differences. So here's a pattern one, here's a pattern two, here's a pattern three, here's another pattern two and a pattern two. Um, these pattern ones are actually uh, fairly close together. I have some asymmetric birds. Uh, where you'll see their data where they have one pattern on one side and another pattern on another side. But overall, <coughs> within this confined area, I didn't actually find a lot of variation. So the best way to test for individual recognition would be to come back to the site and manipulate individuals and see if their mates or their neighbors reacted to changing the way they look. Um, that will be further work down the line. For my dissertation, this is as close as I get. Uh, so I'm going to say from what I, data I have, it doesn't seem that it's controlled by individual recognition. So let's take a look at status signaling. So in this way, we're actually looking at a proxy for condition, which is the regression of the mass of the bird by the wing cord. So trying to get um, different size birds, are they actually uh, get the, the mass controlled for size? So we can actually look at the condition of them. The females and the males are both caught during incubation. So the males should actually be in poorer condition than the females because the females are being fed by the males and the males are doing most of the work. When the chicks hatch, then the females will join in on the hunting effort themselves. So the females potentially could be in really good condition and their males could be in lower condition. But you would expect then if you've got a difference that um, in tail pattern, if it's signaling potentially that the male is a better hunter to the female, that he would be in better condition while he's hunting. Um, there's no significant difference in males with different tail patterns in the condition of their females. And no conditional significant difference in the tail patterns as condition of males with different tail patterns for themselves. And there is no difference in the variation. This is going to be a theme. <laughs> All right. So let's go back now we're going to look at mate choice so we looked at individual recognition doesn't seem to be that the one thing we can test for status signaling at the moment doesn't seem to uh, be significant in that way so let's take a look and see if there's any difference potentially in our proxy for female choice in that way again we're going to look at um, the number of eggs laid and the tail pattern of the males uh, I'm not going to show you variation because it say, tells exactly the same story um, there was no difference in the number of eggs females laid uh, dependent upon their tail pattern of their mate. And then let's look at, uh, is there a difference actually did females with mated to certain males nest sooner in the year? Um, so doing a proxy for um, the, the confidence they had in their male uh, that they chose, the mate that they chose. And I divided out Hopland, or the Flying M Ranch from Hopland, Sonoma, and Blue Oak, because the Central Valley breeds about a, a month earlier than um, the Bay Area does. Uh, and if you are lower in the y-axis, these are ordinal dates, you're nesting sooner. And if you are uh, higher, then you're nesting later in the uh, spring and summer. And there was no significant difference uh, for tail pattern for either site. Um, there, there was a hint 
uh, of something potentially going on there, but uh, it, it was not to be. And then Hoplin or Flying M didn't repeat that hint either. So it seems to be that uh, there's no hint of mate choice going on uh, or female uh, effort for males with different tail patterns. All right, let's look at, at our proxy for, for actual fitness, which would be the number of fledglings that a nest produces. Uh, in this one, uh, these would be the number of fledglings that were present in the nest when we banded them. And then I would subtract if after I checked the nest later, there was a dead fledgling in it, I would subtract that number. But in general, the birds that I banded in the nest, the chicks, that number would fledge out of the nest. Um, so again, uh, there, there was no significant difference in the tail pattern of the male and the number of fledglings they, they produced. Um, though there is higher variability in the number of uh, males with the pattern three. So this last set of behavioral selection data that I did uh, was my attempt to, to get as much data as possible at, uh, out of my last uh, year. Um, because as Rory said, I had problems. I had weather problems. I had high predation rates. Uh, I lost essentially most of 2010 and I lost all of 2011. Uh, so I attempted to get uh, an understanding of direct effort that males did at nests and I employ um, remote sensing cameras for this. I use Bushnell trophy cameras that I put on a mount and they face straight up at the box, four feet away from the box at least. I used <coughs> ten cameras, one of them failed, so I have nine cameras worth of data. Uh, I looked specifically at the first 16 days post hatching of the eggs. Um, <coughs> on average, each camera collected about 333 hours of data and uh, a total of around about 3,336 3, observational hours for the entire project. So lots and lots of observational hours. Some of the interesting things I got that doesn't relate specifically to the question I was asking is some information about diet. And uh, Sean and I are pretty interested in this, actually. So there's a lot of regular things you would think. This is a female dropping off a spider. They ate a lot of insects. They ate a lot of uh, number of birds. This is some poor little probably thrush that it, it caught and uh, plucked all the feathers off and is dropping it off. They ate a fair number of mammals. But the majority of what they ate, actually, and this is just Hopland, were herps. So they caught Spilopris. They caught Elgaria. They caught Skiltonias, so skinks, and they also caught snakes. And so uh, this is a male and this is a female bringing into the nest a, a small little king snake. Um, and then some other interesting data I got was about predation at the nests. Most of my predation seemed to be either raccoons or snakes, but then also nest defense. Now I'll do this series of photos two times for you because it, it's kind of really interesting. And Sean and I are going to write this up. This is what happens <coughs> to a snake, apparently, if the kestrel is around to figure out that they're going to predate the nest. <laughs> so once again, that's a female kestrel pulling a gopher snake out of the box and dropping it nine feet on the ground. <laughs> and according to my notes, uh, she didn't lose any chicks in that effort. But then the snake came back several days later during the middle of the night and, and got a couple of the chicks. So, if you have a very diligent female, apparently they will defend the nest even from large uh, snakes and predators. I know they tried to defend them against me. Uh, that was somewhat painful. So, so I attempt to uh, average the data across the nest boxes because, again, some of the ca um, cameras didn't. Well, some of the chips that I had recording uh, cards, recording the information in the cameras themselves, uh, then failed on a couple of them. So the number of hours I have for each individual is not the same. So in order to try and compensate for that, I looked at two different metrics. I looked at the percent of the total deliveries by males for the entire 16 days post hatching, and I also looked at deliveries per hour by male. So the deliveries um, per hour over the entire period and the percent of all the deliveries done at that nest that were actually done by the male. And again, across tail pattern, you can see uh, that there really isn't any significant difference. Um, now, again, sample size is very small, especially uh, for the different patterns. I only had one male that had a pattern, one that I had a camera out with. Um, 
but at the same time, he's got over 100 hours worth of recorded observational data. So, um, and I know the data I collected does actually track uh, the performance at the nest well. So here what I've plotted out for you guys is the five nest boxes that have the most complete data across the 16 days post hatching. And what you're looking at is just the number of visits per day by the male. And you can actually see that they do go up and that reflects the fact that those chicks are growing and the males have to be more attentive and drop off more food. So I did, I believe, get a, a fairly good idea of the behavior and the attendance that males did at the nest. Um, it could possibly be I'll get something if Jeff and I employ more cameras and I have more pattern ones to distinguish, but there is essentially complete overlap here. There's really not a lot of difference, except for, for this guy right here, that's box 32. They ate almost all insects, it looked like. <laughs> so instead of the other ones eating larger prey, they just did constant deliveries of insects. <coughs> um, so that also factored in. <coughs> all right. So um, <laughs> all the predictions uh, failed. So uh, according to the data I have, and now given, remember, small sample sizes with some of it, I had problems and I was going between sites as well, problems with predation and stuff. It's not a complete, um, it's not the data set I would like to test these predictions with. But the data I do have seem to actually tell negatively that the male pattern and the male variation on the tails of American kestrels is not, uh, does not seem to factor into mate choice, status signaling, or individual recognition. So there is one thing then uh, I thought to bring it out a little bit broader. So I work just within Northern California, and the bird has an extremely wide range. So I've answered the two questions I was going to show you, <coughs> but let's look across the entire species range and see if, if potentially there's something going on at the broader scale, say at the population level. And so what I did then is I went back to museums, I got 667 samples from breeding time periods across all of North America. Um, I also had a number of uh, banders uh, who donated data to me, uh, which is amazing. Uh, the banding community is, is absolutely amazing about providing information. And it was very interesting. It seems actually, so here's where I work for my behavioral sampling. And you see about, you know, an even split between the three different patterns. But then as you move east, you lose pattern three. So birds then on the east coast seem to have a, um, a larger number of pattern one showing up. Except for, remember this is a separate subspecies right here. So one subspecies except for Georgia and Florida, and then another one for the rest of it. So also as we move across, let's look at variation. You see the same sort of idea, is as you move from west to east, you go from having a large number of no variation, small variation, to higher amounts of large variation. Now potentially, this could be confounded by the fact that what you have in the west area is larger numbers of pattern one, and pattern one doesn't have large variation in it. So what I did is I took out, oh excuse me, pattern three doesn't have large variation in it. Um, so I took out pattern three, and actually you still see the same idea, that as you move from the west to the east, kestrels are getting larger amounts of black and white on their tails. So stuff that, um, what I'm not going to show you guys today is uh, information that I uh, looked at for genetic correlation, population structure across the uh, subspecies. Um, but it looks like we do have a population break, a very weak population break going on here, and then with the subspecies here, and then here for another large population. And it seems that there's no real correlation between habitat going on. But there is something, something odd that's going on there. But what I've come up with now for my dissertation, <coughs> the data I have gathered, 
is essentially telling us that it appears I've found a tail pattern, a level of variation that is binnable, has repeatable patterns, is inheritable, but doesn't actually have, at what I can tell, a behavioral use and a strong genetic correlation or any ecological correlation. <laughs> so potentially what I've been looking at is a trait that is fluctuating and doesn't have any negative potential effect in the population. It's, it's fluctuating across the um, population, except for here, where there may be something going on, um, which turned out that potentially I should have been doing my behavioral work <laughs> there <laughs> instead of there. But uh, that will be future work. And that's essentially it. So I'd like to say thank you to my committee, my parents, foremost actually, because without them this project wouldn't be possible. Uh, my dad built all my boxes for me. He put them all up and he came, uh, what was fantastic about helping me get over my fear of climbing on ladders, which doesn't work when you're working on S box species. Um, the Bowie Lab, my office mates, the entire MBC community, all the in individual institutions that gave me money, that provided samples to me, the people who ran uh, the different uh, reserves that I was able to use. Um, I want to say a very special thanks to all my uh, student field crew who uh, never complained when I said the start time was 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> uh, never, ever. Or that I would put them in tiny little cloth blinds and I wanted them to record everything that happened at a nest for two hours and nothing would happen. <laughs> and a very special thank you to all my Vanderfield crew who taught me to do uh, all my field work. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.